Wow. I didn't want her to stop. <laughs> Sounding pretty good. But uh, most of it's untrue. Now, really, I um, wanted to, you know, I was excited to come here and just speak about food, my relationship with food, and um, my relationship with sustainability, sustainability of um, of food, I think, really pertains to the sustainability of our culture and all the small cultures that we have throughout America. Um, really kick this thing off, I want to tell you just a, a little bit you know, about myself personally. I, um, I did grow up hunting and fishing, and um, my wife probably disagrees with that because I haven't grown up much. About this time of year, if you're a guy and you're from down in this part of the world, you probably know what I'm talking about. So hunting season's just beginning, and the ducks are starting to migrate. The first cold fronts are coming through, and it's like, oh, wow, this is great. And why is that important? That's really important to me because even as a kid, when I saw the duck flying, it was like the old cartoon characters where you'd see, like, the roast flying through the air. Or you'd see the pot of gumbo coming into the decoys. Or, you know, and I always equated what I ate with what we had available. And a lot of that um, certainly resonated with my home uh, cooking of New Orleans. And uh, in New Orleans, we did need glossy magazines and uh, Food Network TV shows to tell us how to eat with the seasons. That's just part of it. That's how... That's how our grandparents and great-grandparents lived. And now we've progressed ourselves to the point that we've lost that relationship with food. And we're, there's a bunch of people desperately trying to bring it back. How many of you were here last night for the, uh, for the speech? Uh, I'm sure it's really powerful. And I'm sure all of you had seen Food, Inc. and read Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Can I see a show of hands? Who's seen Food, Inc.? It's really scary. Um, joined the Marines after high school. I wasn't smart like my wife. I, I had to learn the hard way. And so after that, I, uh, I did that for a while. And I didn't cook in the Marines. I just um, I was in the infantry and had the time of my life and wouldn't trade it for anything. But I knew I didn't want to make a career of it. And then, you know, enough bad food. I decided to go to culinary school. So I went to the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, and came up um, cooking at a time when food was very opulent, and we would bring things in from all around the world and different parts of the country, and good food was really about how exotic could it possibly be. And that's how we were trained at that point in time. And on the uh, West Coast, there was a lady named Alice Waters really making headway in, uh, in and around Berkeley. And on the East Coast, there was Larry Forgione that really sparked the whole or reignited farm-to-table element of um, you know, small family farms providing foods for um, urban areas for chefs to actually cook for their customers, as if this was something so novel. Again, we kind of lost that. And I still had never put two and two together because I was coming up at this time where, okay, that's what Alice Waters was doing. That's what Larry Forgione was doing. That's wonderful. But I want to learn to cook and be the best chef that I can be. And that means oftentimes bringing things in from all around the world and blah, 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 blah. Well, then I moved to Germany with my wife. And I made my apprenticeship in a small town called um, Obermunstertal near it's in the high mountains of the Black Forest. And there I got to learn something very interesting. Every, every farm in the whole Baden-Württemberg region was organic, biologique. And the organic farms um, had to, or all farms there in that area, and including in our household, we couldn't use chlorine bleach. We had to be careful. You just couldn't buy it. You could go to France, and a lot of people would do that. You'd go to France and buy all the forbidden uh, chlorine and bring it to Germany and maybe wash it clothes. But they really, they were very cautious of their water supply and conscious about what went into the soil. And certain times, two times a year, you would see the people out cutting the hay by hand and um, 
then you would see them spraying the, these small fields. These weren't large farms. These were small farms. And they would spray these fields with the manure from that had been composted throughout the winter. And in the spring, they would um, do that. And then... And it really, that right there really sparked something. Not so much the manure or the smell of my beautiful little town of Munstertal, but the idea of just making do with what you have. And why didn't we have that? Why did we lose that? I'm the first generation of all the Beshes, 400-something years of Beshes. I'm the first generation that had left the farm. And um, at that moment, it really brought me right back to the farm. At that moment, it realized, I started to realize that when I go home, when I move back to Louisiana, I can actually do some of this. This is really neat. I can, um, you know, I, I, I think too often we hear catchphrases of sustainability, sustainable this, green this, green that. You, we've all heard it. And what does it really mean? And I think it really comes down to just responsibility. And so I came back home and I started many failed attempts at farming. There's a reason why I'm one generation away from the farm, because I don't belong there. But it made me appreciate the farmers in my life. And it makes me, made me appreciate the people that really provided food. Um, and toiling with the soil and um, producing as much as they could out of it um, in a very responsible way, in a, in a way that... Um, Reduces the amount of runoff. I'm from Louisiana. I'm from the coastal area. We have this incredible river that runs right through our state called the Mississippi. Mississippi is polluted by every tributary, by about two-thirds of all the tributaries of small rivers, creeks, and streams that bring all this runoff from, our, from the Midwest, all these farms that, uh, that just... In, Incredibly, just gross amounts of um, nutrients that we definitely don't need poured into the soil, and all, gross amounts of nitrates and nitrites that are poured into the soil that make their way down the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico to create these red zones or these red tides. That um, they're two, actually two different things, but the, these big red zones are these big dead zones with uh, very little oxy oxygen. And obviously, they, um, it will kill off basically whatever is in there. Uh, that's one problem that we have off the coast of uh, Texas from time to time with, um, with the oyster population here around the Galveston Bay area. You have, a lot of it has to do with just runoff. And so it really sparked concern in me that, you know, if I'm going to do this, and I'm going to promote local and um, responsible farming, then we can have a huge impact just in our little watershed down in South Louisiana. Well, I think that I'm coming along and I've got this one wonderful restaurant called August. And things are just moving along there and I was more concerned with farming for me so I can create funny looking little dishes where things stand up on each other and people scratch their heads and say, oh wow, chef, you're wonderful. And then comes Hurricane Katrina. So Hurricane Katrina took all that away. We had about 120 employees prior to the storm. And a few days later, we had me, myself, Jennifer. She didn't last very long. Um, my partner, we had about four of us all together to reopen the restaurant. Of course, there was no market. New Orleans was still flooded. And so we decided well, what we would do is just get out there and start feeding people. We had coolers full of food. We had resources. And my marine friends miraculously kind of, you know, we all kind of got in touch with each other via text messaging. The first text message I ever sent or received was right after Hurricane Katrina because we had no cellular service. And uh, it kind of tells you my age when we're talking about texting in such, our, you know, in a very archaic sense. But the interesting thing is that we rallied together and we started feeding people. We started feeding people things that we had at our fingertips, rice, red beans, white beans, black beans, whatever bean we could get our hands on. We would start these, we started four different kind of soup kitchen areas where we started cooking around the clock and we would take food out on the, on 
flat boots out into the city. I remember the first guy that I served uh, a bowl of red beans to, he looks at it, and this cat's wading in the water, and I'm in a boat, and I'm scooping it out of an igloo ice chest, and I serve him these red beans, and he says, man, that's not how you make red beans. <laughs> and I said, say, brother, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> I'm an iron chef. And he's like, well, my mama does this, and my mama does that, and blah, 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 blah. And all the while, New Orleans is underwater. I think definitely I'm going out of business. I've surrendered everything to God, just thinking, look, you know what? I, I had a calling. I, I'm here on this earth. You've given me the talents to cook for people. Now put me to work. Show me what to do. And I was kind of led in this direction. I was led just to get out there, take off your chef hat, and cook for the people. And we cooked and cooked and cooked and served thousands of people a day, thousands of people a day. Finally, there's nobody else to serve because they had all left the city, and the city was pretty much empty. And we had done all this for free with just whatever we could scrape together and family donations and whatever my Marine buddies would send down. And it really hit me. And the fact that this guy was... Had, you know, had, had made fun of my red beans, made me realize that New Orleans was going to be okay because of this quirky culture. And that culture really stemmed from the food ways that surrounded it. And that we eat the way we eat because that's what we have. We eat what we eat because these are the cultures that came and settled in New Orleans. And so the Africans brought us all the gumbos, which is actually um, in several different uh, um, dialects means okra. So the okra and gumbo, the same thing. We have the, the greens and the beans and the rice and all of these rich things were brought to us by the, the Africans, the Spanish, the French. And consequently, the Germans as well brought us all the smoked meats and everything. And so we eat the way we eat because of the way, you know, one, because of what we had around us. And two, because of the cultures that settled there. And so when I started thinking about sustainability and how I'd reopen and create a new sustainable, not just restaurant, but help create a sustainable city, I had to pay homage to all these other factors that took place. It was just not about me having a restaurant so I could call it green and then charge more money for it. It's really about creating something that will sustain itself, creating something that would sustain this beautiful culture that we had at our fingertips. And so time went on and eventually we started feeding people these, um, not feeding people, but we had uh, the big oil companies, nobody likes the oil companies. And so the oil companies come to town and they need to reopen all the refineries up and down the Mississippi River. And so we were the only people there at the time kind of feeding things before the government really moved in in force. And so somebody asked if we'd mind feeding the people at this refinery. And we said, absolutely. And we charged them. <laughs> and then another refinery found out that there's you know, they were eating at this one, and so we, we started charging the other, other refinery, and we made a fortune. At least in my mind, we did. But then we had all these people stretched all across the United States, a lot of them in Texas, and we made a commitment, myself, business partner, and a couple of the cooks that worked for me, that what we would do is we would just divide it all up. And if you came back to New Orleans and you came back to work for us because the four of us couldn't sustain this business venture that we had going, that we would just give you all the wages that you'd missed in, you know, in hopes that you would hurry up and get back. And then we'd take all the profits that we made and just divide them, among, divide them up amongst everybody. And my um, business partner, Octavio Mantia, calls that my dabble in communism. I'm no communist, but... I just thought, if we're going to sustain this, and if we're going to create this esprit de corps that I so badly wanted to create and give people a reason to move back to New Orleans, then we need to lead by example, and we need to just share it all. And it was one of the most incredible things that ever happened in my life. One thing after the next, 
we started to blossom. 